Welcome to NCORE's Connect and Explore webinar today. We're delighted to have you. I'm Elaine Arkin. I will be hosting today's webinar um, on the Measures Registry User Guides, two of the guides on individual diet and food environment. Uh, we'll have three sessions uh, with a great set of speakers. Um, and then we will have time for you to ask questions of, of our speakers in the 101 section. And then at the end, I'll just uh, preview upcoming webinars, especially part two of this Measures Registry User Guide series. Down just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you have a question for our speakers during the presentations, please write it in the chat box on the right side of your screen. We will have, we'll be able to address those questions then during the one-on-one -on -one session after all of the presentations have been completed. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please let us know using that same chat box or the uh, number that Kelly gave you. If you're having trouble logging into the webinar but can hear us on the phone, please email us at NCOR, N -C -C -O -R, at FHI360.org, and we'll work with you to resolve the problem and get you on the webinar. And finally, one more very important technical note. If you've decided to listen to our webinar using your computer speakers, please turn down or preferably mute your computer microphone. This will greatly reduce the potential for background noise. And we love it when people have uh, dogs in their office, but we'd prefer not to hear them. So thank you very much. Now we'll also be live tweeting during today's webinar. If you're on Twitter or other social media, we encourage you to join the conversation using the hashtag ConnectExplore and following the Twitter handle at NCOR, N-C-C-O-R. We have a great lineup today. We're very grateful to have Jill Reedy, Sharon Kirkpatrick, Amanda Raffle, Leslie Little, and Allison Myers. Jill Reedy is the Program Director of the Risk Factors Assessment Branch at NIH's National Cancer Institute. And she was one of the co-leads of the NCORE Measures Registry Workgroup, along with David Berrigan, who will be presenting on the part two of this webinar series in about two weeks. Sharon Kirkpatrick is an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo. Along with Amanda Raffel, she was one of the authors of the Individual Diet Guide. And Amanda is a doctoral student at the University of Waterloo um, and worked with Sharon on that Individual Diet Guide. Leslie Little is a professor and chair of the Department of Health Behavior at UNC's Gelling School of Global Public Health. And she was an author, along with Allison Myers, of the Food Environment Guide. And finally, but certainly not uh, least, we're delighted to have Allison, who's the Executive Director of CounterTools and an adjunct professor at UNC's Gilling School of Global Public Health. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and just before we hear from Jill, we'd like to start things off with an interactive poll just to, uh, uh, to learn a little about all of you on the call. You can submit your answer directly on the screen. So which user guides are you most interested in using to inform your work? Okay, so thank you all who uh, had a quick touch here to, to uh, give us a little feedback. I see food environment um, has the most votes, followed by individual diet. And again, we'll be talking about physical activity, uh, individual and environment in the next uh, session. So thank you all for contributing to our interactive poll. Uh, with that, Jill, I'd like to turn it over to you to introduce the project. 
Hi, thanks so much, Elaine. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the webinar. This is Jill Reedy, and I'm excited to be introducing the user guides to all of you. As many of you know, the NCORE's Measures Registry is a free online repository of articles about measures, and it's widely recognized as a key resource that gives both researchers and practitioners access to detailed information on measures in one easy-to-search location. Even with this resource, however, it can be challenging for users to choose the most appropriate measures for their work. And so in order to address this need, NCORE began the Measures Registry User Guides project back in 2015, and we're happy to say that we launched the User Guides in February of 2017. And we also wanted to note that the development of this User Guides project was supported by a two-year grant from the JPB Foundation. So the Measures Registry User Guides cover the same four domains of the Measures Registry, which are specifically focused on those areas that can influence childhood obesity on a population level. And this includes the individual diet and food environment, and also the individual physical activity and physical activity environment. And today, as you've heard, we're highlighting the diet-specific domains, so individual diet and the food environment. The Measures Registry User Guides are really designed to help provide an overview of measurement, also to describe general principles of measurement selection, and present case studies to walk users through the process of using the measures registry to select the appropriate measure for your purpose or for your question. Additionally, it will be available to help direct researchers and practitioners to additional resources and other sources of useful information. The user guides also aim to help move the field forward by fostering more consistent use of measures in order to help with standardization, meta-analyses, and synthesis. So the user guides were written by several internationally recognized experts from each of the four different domains, and we'll be hearing from these authors now. Additionally, the authors received feedback and guidance throughout the process and development of the user guides from two expert panels, one for food and nutrition and one for physical activity. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Jill. So I'm going to jump right in here to talk about why we would measure individual diet in the context of obesity. So obesity is influenced by many factors, including dietary behaviors, and dietary behaviors relevant to obesity begin in infancy and continue into adolescence. Therefore, measuring diet as robustly as possible across the life cycle is essential to monitoring dietary behaviors, the factors that influence those behaviors, as well as the effectiveness of interventions that might be relevant to obesity prevention. For the purpose of the user guide, dietary behavior is conceptualized primarily as dietary intake. Generally speaking, dietary intake refers to the foods, beverages, and possibly supplements that are consumed by individuals and populations. Researchers and practitioners are interested in measures that can capture details such as how foods and beverages were prepared, the quantities consumed, how often different foods and beverages are consumed, as well as contextual details such as when, where, and with whom meals and snacks are consumed. Other measures on the right-hand side are intended to capture related behaviors that may also influence eating patterns and body weight. Generally, the measures within the registry that include constructs such as knowledge and attitudes do also include some assessment of intake. Diet is a complex phenomenon. We obviously eat and drink every day. We eat and drink different foods and beverages. Some of those are consumed most days by most people, whereas others are consumed more irregularly. And our diets change across days, seasons, and the life cycle. And measuring intake is therefore, not surprisingly, also complex. This is partly due to the fact that typically we're not interested in consumption on a given day, but rather habitual or long-term average intake over a period of time. It's generally not possible to assess usual intake in community living, sorry, community dwelling individuals. And therefore, usually self-report measures are the tools upon which we rely. 
Now I'm going to move on to discuss measurement characteristics, beginning with validity and reliability. And in selecting measures to assess really any kind of construct, either intake or other behaviors relevant to diet, it's criti critical to consider these properties. So validity refers to the ability of a measure to assess what it intends to, whereas reliability refers to the extent to which a measure is consistent or stable over time. There are different types of validity and reliability, and these different types may be particularly salient to a particular research question and study design. There's much more detail on this within the guides. In dietary assessment, we often speak about measurement error, and there are two types of measurement error. With systematic error, measurements depart from truth in a consistent direction, and the result is that the data, whether it's intake data or something else, are biased in one direction. For diet, this would be either toward under or over reporting, and this is depicted in the first graph with the red and blue lines. Contributors to systematic error, which is also called bias, include recall, limitations, reactivity, or changes in response to monitoring, and also social desirability. Systematic error can be thought of as being related to validity. With random error, the errors may be in the direction of either under or overestimation, and this is shown in the second graph. In dietary intake data, the main contributor to random error is day-to-day -day variation in what we eat and drink across days. And this affects primarily measures capturing intake for one or a few days. And random error can be thought of as being related to reliability. In considering measurement error in self-report dietary data collected for children, considerations include the stage of cognitive development or one's capacity to learn, remember, and pay attention, literacy and numeracy skills, as well as biases associated with recalling intake in the past or monitoring intake in real time, as well as social desirability, which I've already mentioned. An additional consideration, particular to children, is the need for proxy reporting, particularly for younger children. It's possible that proxies will have incomplete information, and proxies are also prone to the same biases that I've already discussed here in terms of reporting what their children consumed. The measures registry can help identify sources of information on the evaluation of measures in terms of their validity and reliability. So you see an example here looking at criterion validity of a particular 24-hour recall and FFQ, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And looking at this type of information on the registry can allow researchers and practitioners to examine whether evaluations have been conducted with similar populations as their target study, and also the methods that were used for evaluation. A few important caveats relevant to obesity research. One is that estimates of intake based on self-report are known to be biased, and estimates of energy intake are particularly badly biased. And therefore, other indicators of energy balance, such as weight and height, should be used to monitor energy balance in place of estimates of caloric intake that are derived from self-report. Furthermore, the error in reporting is associated with body mass index, as well as social desirability. And this really complicates comparisons of intake patterns across groups that might differ in these characteristics or characteristics that might be related to body weight, such as race or ethnicity. It also warrants mentioning that in intervention studies, exposure to the intervention itself may elicit changes in reporting that bias results. Moving on now to the measures of individual diet, and the user guide includes a section dedicated to describing these measures in much more detail than we'll be able to cover today, and includes objective measures as well as self-report. It includes some details in terms of the extent to which these measures reflect true intake or their measurement error properties, but today I'll just briefly review the self-report measures along with Amanda, who I'll turn over to in a few minutes. So a means of categorizing measures is whether they assess short-term or long-term intake. Methods assessing short-term intake include 24-hour recalls and records or diaries on the left, and longer-term methods include food frequency questionnaires and screeners. 24-hour recalls capture the total diet in rich detail over a day or a few days. They're thought to be culturally neutral because they don't rely on pre-specified food lists. 
Recalls have traditionally been cost prohibitive, particularly for large-scale research. However, this has changed with technological innovation. Sources of error in recalls include imperfect short-term memory, as well as inaccuracy in portion size estimation. However, recalls have been shown to capture intake with less bias than do food frequency questionnaires. And as a result, they are recommended for research questions that rely on quantitative estimates of intake among a population or subpopulation. Some specific considerations related to the use of recalls with children include the potential for limited concepts of time and limited recall abilities. As a result, collecting data for the past 24 hours, starting from the time at which the recall begins, may be preferable to reporting for the prior day from midnight to midnight. For young children, proxy reporting is necessary, but input from children is important as they become more independent and spend more time away from home. The guide includes additional considerations for enhancing the quality of recall data collected for children. Records or diaries are the next tool we'll look at, and they share many characteristics with recalls. The main distinction is that with a recall, the respondent reports what was consumed yesterday or over the past 24 hours, whereas with a record, the respondent keeps track of what he or she consumes in real time. And this real-time tracking can lead to reactivity in that individuals may change their eating behavior. This is a source of error when our interest is in capturing usual intake. Completion of food records requires a minimum level of literacy. As well, children must have some basic knowledge of foods and how they're prepared, as well as the ability to quantify intake. And as with recalls, proxy reporting is necessary for young children. Specific to records, the burden associated with tracking over multiple days may result in compliance issues due to boredom. And I'll now turn it over to Amanda to discuss the long-term instruments. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, so the next method is the food frequency questionnaire, often referred to as an FFQ. FFQs aim to capture usual intake by asking about the frequency of consumption over a long period of time, such as a month or a year. So their completion relies upon long-term memory, as well as the ability to average consumption over time. Frequency questionnaires don't provide the detail that short-term methods do and require tailoring to the target group. However, prior to technological innovations in short-term tools, frequency questionnaires were less costly and had been more widely used. Now, screeners are similar to FFQs, except they can't be used to estimate total diet. They may be of particular use for components in a diet that are not widely spread through the food supply, such as sugar-sweetened beverages. Generally, FFQs and screeners are not likely to be ideal for use with children because of children's limited cognitive abilities and incomplete concepts of time. The length of some questionnaires may also result in boredom, which often leads to poor compliance or reporting quality. Additionally, children may not have an adequate understanding of composite foods that are used in such questionnaires. Now with technological innovations, such as web-based recalls and mobile records, it's becoming more feasible to collect dietary data in a wide range of studies and settings. Developments targeted to children include the use of avatars or cartoon characters and interactive questionnaires. Technology can reduce cost and burden and improve engagement, but these innovations aren't necessarily a magic bullet since they still continue to rely upon self-report in addition to requiring uh, some sort of computer or, mo or mobile device literacy. But this is a lively area of research, and efforts to improve these methods are ongoing. In, term of, in terms of other dietary behaviors, the Measures Registry highlights questionnaires that may be used to assess attitudes towards food, food perceptions, and restrictive behaviors, as an example. These measures vary in length and complexity, and the completion may require parental assistance depending on the age of the child. Now, as with intake, reporting may be influenced by the respondent or proxy's body mass index and social desirability biases that Sharon described earlier. So we'll now move on to measurement in action in terms of the process of choosing a measure for a study. I'll first highlight this series of guided questions 
um, summarized here that are intended to assist in selecting the most appropriate measure for a study. These questions were informed by a set developed for physical activity and sedentary behavior. The questions relate to the research aim, study design, population, and parameters related to the dietary behaviors of interest, as well as some logistical considerations. More detail on each of these questions can be found within the guide. We'll now turn our attention to a few case studies designed to bring to light different considerations, such as examining diet as an exposure versus an outcome, proxy versus self-reporting, and the capture of a comprehensive versus a narrow scope of behaviors that are related to diet. The guide includes many more cases to illustrate these considerations, but we'll be reviewing three of them today. For each case, we'll briefly walk through the background, key considerations, and possibilities in terms of measure selection. And so I'll begin with case study one. In case one, a project team wishes to estimate average intake and main sources of food groups among children of varying ages, um, differentiated, differentiated by sociodemographic characteristics. Now, we'll need a measure that enables quantification of intake with the least bias possible. Our behavior of interest includes the intake of multiple components, including food groups, such as fruits, vegetables, and dairy products. And of course, proxy reporting will be needed for younger children. Now, moving on to measure selection, the need for quantifying multiple components suggests a short-term measure, such as a recall or record, potentially taking advantage of technological innovations. The focus on capturing different components rules out screeners, which are also not recommended for estimating mean intakes due to their bias. And of course, the same is true of food frequency questionnaires. There's a need for tools that can be completed by both proxy reporters for younger children and by older children themselves. So therefore, it is important to consider ease of interaction with the interface as well as burden. It should also be considered whether the groups differ in characteristics, such as body mass index, that may indicate differential misreporting that would affect the root final findings. Um, and I should also quickly note that in this example, we were interested in average intakes. But had we been interested in other characteristics, such as the percentiles and the distribution, we would need to collect repeat recalls and use different forms of statistical modeling. And of course, this is covered in the guide and in other resources in more detail. Moving on to the next case, in this instance, the aim is to examine the relationship between diet quality and markers of disease, such as blood, blood glucose levels among adolescents. In terms of considerations, the behavior of interest here includes the total diet, which will allow characterization of diet quality. And within the context of studies in which diet is an exposure, strategies have been developed to reduce error in dietary data. For example, we can use information collected using multiple measures and take advantage of the strengths of different instruments. So this will be something to consider in our measure selection. Finally, with adolescents, self-administration will be possible, though we should consider the burden to alleviate boredom. Feasible methods in this case could include recalls, records, or food frequency questionnaires. Interviewer-administered recalls would be cost prohibitive, given that we're following adolescents over time, usually in this kind of study. And unless the record involves technology-enabled automated coding, the manual coding involved in records would require considerable resources. This narrows the choices to a self-administered recall, a mobile device-based or otherwise automated food record, or a food frequency questionnaire. A combination of methods could be used, again, allowing the use of techniques such as regression calibration to reduce error in our intake data. And analytic approaches such as these are briefly mentioned in the guide, and we also highlight additional salient resources. And moving on to the final case, um, where a project team would like to assess intake of sugar sweetened beverages and alternative beverages before and after changes to vending machine policies in an institution, such as a school. This is an intervention study. So the dietary behavior of interest could be conceptualized narrowly as just the intake of beverages, or more broadly, as the total diet, so that we can characterize how the intervention relates to changes in diet more holistically. Additionally, intake could be conceptualized quantitatively. 
requiring us to ask about the cons amounts consumed or simply as frequency of consumption. Now, depending on the target population, the investigators will need to consider whether self-reporting is possible. It's also necessary to consider whether the respondents might report differently at follow-up due to exposure to the intervention, particularly if it's accom accompanied by an educational campaign encouraging reduced intake of sugar sweetened beverages. Moving on to measure selection, if the project team chooses a narrow focus, they could use screeners, which reduce burden but increase bias. But screeners may be difficult for children, depending on their cognitive abilities. If the team chooses a broader focus, a more comprehensive tool, such as recalls or records, is needed. An FFQ could be possible depending on the children's cognitive development. So to address the potential for intervention-related biases in reporting, the project team could complement intake data with sales data from the vending machines. The guide includes additional resources on each of these cases and the possible decisions that could be made regarding measures. To summarize, dietary behavior and its measurement are complex. However, measuring dietary behaviors can provide useful information in terms of obesity prevention. The selection of measures to capture diet will involve weighing various considerations to arrive at the best choice. And as Jill mentioned earlier, the use of the measures registry along with the guides can contribute to greater standardization, enabling clearer syntheses of evidence to inform policy. As noted, assessing diet behavior in children requires attention to unique considerations, and researchers and practitioners are encouraged to consult colleagues with expertise in diet assessment, as well as relevant resources. Beyond data collection, it's essential that dietary data are analyzed appropriately, and so consulting a statistician is also a good idea. Of course, findings should be interpreted in light of what is known about dietary data, including its properties related to measurement error, and it's important to clearly report methods to ensure that the research is replicable and interpretable. Just to quickly highlight, within the user guide, we note a number of other relevant resources, and there's much more detail on the topics that we've covered today. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is just a, a wonderful uh, presentation by all four of you, and it really makes sitting down to think about the purpose and design of a study such a pleasure. It's just uh, great to hear all of this, and so much work has certainly gone into it. Um, so we have one more session, and that's uh, Leslie and Allison. I'll turn it over to you. Well, hi. Uh, this is Leslie Lytle. Uh, thanks so much for your interest in the measures related to the food environment. We saw that on the poll. That was awesome. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about those measures and how they're presented in the NCOR um, registry. Um, my name is Leslie Lytle, and I'm presenting with my colleague, Allison Myers. Um, the interest in the food environment has really grown exponentially in the past decade. Um, health, professions, uh, health professionals realize the importance of that larger environment on myriad health outcomes including obesity risk um, and other diet-related diseases such as diabetes. Because of that awareness gleaned from our epidemiologic data, the food environment has also become a target of public health interventions. Um, for both epidemiologic and intervention work, um, we obviously need robust measures of the food environment. For this user guide, we identified three different types of food environments. Um, the physical environment, um, which is the places that we live, work, study, and play. The social environment, or the people that we interact with and our cultural norms. And finally, the person-centered environment, which for this user guide, we're interpreting as the individual's perceptions of their environment. We'll talk a little bit about each of these three uh, different um, areas in, in a bit. Um, a conceptual model that identifies the type of food environments that may influence food choice, dietary consumption patterns, and ultimately dietary-related disease risk, we think is an important starting point for a researcher or practitioner who's trying to understand or, or inter intervene upon some aspect of the food environment in order to improve the health of populations. So in this model, um, the model posits that all three of those environmental factors directly influence food choice but that the physical and social environments also indirectly 
influence choice by affecting the individual's perceptions of the environment. So let's take um, a, a, a little closer look at these three areas. When we think about the physical environment, we're thinking about the places where people make their food choices. For youth, those places are primarily their home, child care, school, other community venues. Stores and restaurants are relevant because that's where their parents or their caretakers procure their food. Um, and the assessment of the physical environment examines such questions as um, how many and what types of food venues are present in, in their neighborhoods or locations. For example, how many fast foods are in a certain census tract. Physical environment also asks the question, what types of foods are, are available? For example, are fresh fruits and vegetables available at the corner stores? When we think about accessibility, we're usually thinking about price. And when we think about health-related information, we're, we're typically looking at, is there some kind of nutrition labeling or some information about the nutrition, nutritional quality of the food present? When we think about the social environment, we're thinking about um, the social reference that children and youth interact with, including other kids, parents, teachers, and other adults. And the types of attributes that we often try to assess include the type or amount of support that kids get um, for eating a healthy diet, um, any role modeling that occurs around eating, rewards that are available in the environment to incentivize behaviors and existing policies, practices, or rules that homes or schools try to enforce. The final piece is the person-centered part of the environment, and that includes the perceptions that people have of their physical environment. Uh, for example, it may include one's perceptions of um, the availability that that water, um, the availability of water in their schools. Um, it may also include their perceptions of the social environment or how a child feels, um, how much support they might get from their teachers to eat a healthy diet. So we're going to use these three different domains or factors um, and we're going to map them to um, um, measures that are available on the registry that can be used to measure this important domain. Starting with the physical, um, GIS or geospatial analysis uses existing data sources to map out elements of the physical environment, such as the number of fast food restaurants in a census block, um, or the proximity of convenience stores to schools in a prescribed area. Other tools that we use to assess the physical environment are observational scans, also known as logs, records, audit tools. And they assess a variety of factors, including availability and pricing. And in the re measures registry, you'll find these kinds of um, measures identified under GIS, environmental observations, records, or logs. This is one quick example of how GIS data can be used. In this one, um, they're showing the density of fast food restaurants in convenience stores for 1,000 residents in a specified geographic area. But visual depictions of the physical environment um, are obviously um, potentially very compelling for policymakers and, and other stakeholders. Um, another example of, um, of, 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 of a measure of the physical environment um, are these types of logs, records, or audit tools. Uh, this, this slide shows what these tools might look like. These tools require trained staff to enter data either on paper and or electronic form. Tools to assess the social environment are typically interviews or questionnaires with parents and or their kids. They're often self-administered and they're, and they're typically self-report. They may also include interviews or questionnaires with policymakers such as school staff or, or principals in order to understand norms, policies, and practices. In the measures registry, the social environment measures are usually found under questionnaires, records, or logs. Um, as, an example, um, um, as an example, the CDC School Health Policy and Practice Survey is a national surveillance tool that is an interview uh, administered to school stakeholders to understand specific school policies. Person-centered measures, measurement tools can be a phone interview, a self-administered questionnaire, 
or for younger children, it might be a questionnaire that's read to them. In the measures registry, these are identified as questionnaires, or records, or logs. As an example, in the Child and Adolescent Trial for Cardiovascular Health, we used the health behavior questionnaire for children in third and fifth grade. In third grade, we read it to them. Um, and one set of questions on the HBQ asked students to report on their perceived social environment. We're going to finish up this section with a few slides on measurement considerations and characteristics. Again, we go back to that conceptual model that we started this presentation with because it's important as a team to consider what aspects of the food environment are, will be important to measure for your specific study question. Reviewing this model before you dive in and pick your measures might help the team answer some important questions such as, what factors or domains do I need to study? Um, obviously, not all projects can study all the elements of the food, question, uh, of the food environment. So being intentional about choosing the domain that's most relevant to your study question or outcome of interest is really of great importance. Part of that consideration may involve determining if one's purpose is to explore all of the environment, environmental predictors or examine just one aspect of the environment. Even within a domain, there are usually important decisions to make about what food environment, environment measures are needed. If, you're, if one is assessing the physical environment, part of this decision um, making has to involve consideration of the expertise available on the team and your resources. If you're going to use GIS, do you have someone on the team who knows GIS and the related software? If you're going to do environmental scans, do you have money for a team of um, environmental obser um, observers? If you're assessing the social environment, one might need to pick one or two important reference groups and focus on maybe one or two aspects of the social environment. So for example, if you're doing an intervention to change the home environment, that likely needs to focus on parents and siblings as the reference. And maybe you're going to focus on um, measures related to role modeling or how eating behavior is incentivized by parents. A great deal of research on the food environment shows that people's perceptions of their environment are often more predictive or as predictive as the actual environment. So finding a way to assess people's perceptions might be incredibly important. Finally, the measures and methods you use may differ if you're evaluating um, an intervention or if you're doing, doing an epidemiologic or, or an etiologic study. Finally, whatever measures you choose should be reliable and valid. As an example, inner rate reliability of an audit tool needs to be evaluated to determine how clear and concise your directions for completing that audit tool is, as well as the quality of the training of the observers. For validity, as an example, some level of construct validity or some verification that the element of the food environment being assessed associated with some health-related outcome will help provide justification for the choice of the measurement tool. There are many other considerations involved in choosing a food environment um, measure. The NCORS user guide helps spell these out. The next section, led by Allison Myers, provides two case study examples of how one may use the measures registry to make decisions on a research project and a community practice project. So I'll turn it over to Allison. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, this is Allison Myers talking. And just in the interest of time, uh, let's be sure everyone on the webinar knows that we'll do everything we can to end on time. We will allow time for questions. And please stay till the end, because there's a little survey, I think, for all of you that will be very beneficial for us. So uh, with that, uh, you can go to the guide for a lot more detail. Uh, there are four food environment case studies, some research, some practice. But we're just going to go through two uh, today, uh, a school-based research study and a restaurant-based practice intervention. Case study one, in this study, we're evaluating a school-based intervention on its ability to positively influence the physical school food environment. And the project team is planning a school-based intervention 
they want to change a la carte offerings in middle school cafeterias. And the primary outcome of the study is the healthfulness of foods sold in the cafeteria, ideally using sales data from cash register receipts and some observation. On the screen, you see a series of considerations for the team as they plan their measures. And one of the themes throughout our entire webinar has been that thinking through these considerations, questions like those on the screen, is perhaps most important as we're working on measuring uh, diet and environment. In this example, the team has already verified that the schools will be willing and able to provide sales data that can detail the food items purchased on a daily basis. However, they'll also need to be able to document foods and beverages that are available for purchase before and after the intervention. Other considerations include how many data collection periods will there or should there be, what resources are available for data collection, cleaning, and analysis, and who will collect which types of data, for example, staff, study teams, volunteers, and finally, how much detail will be needed to properly evaluate uh, to meet the research aims. Through a formative assessment period, the team discovers that items on an a la carte line change quickly, so multiple data collection days need to be scheduled, both for the pre and post phases of data collection. They're getting direct sales data from cash registers, so that's helpful. However, not all schools are uh, involved are willing and able to follow the a la carte measurement protocol, so the team will need to collect data on foods available themselves. As such, the team decides to look for a valid and reliable data collection tool that will be used by the study team. A team leader navigates to the measures registry, chooses the food environment domain, enters school in the search bar, and finds uh, more than 100 matches. After reviewing all of the matches, one study called TACOS was found that uses sales data from cash registers to assess a la carte sales in schools. TACOS also has a food inventory, uh, but the protocol was seen to be too labor intensive and beyond the study's resources. So they keep looking within the measures registry and found the idea study shown on the screen that created a list of 20 categories of foods based on the CDC's School Health Policy and Practice Survey. This a la carte inventory has established criterion validity and can be adapted to meet the limited study budget. So to recap this, we're evaluating a school-based intervention. We're using sales data and observational data about what's available before and after the intervention. A key consideration for the team was who, and how, who will collect data and how much to collect. And the measures registry was used to find two previous study measures that will work for the current project. In case study three, moving on, we have a large city health department who wants to improve healthy eating behaviors in small, independent neighborhood restaurants. Their goal ultimately is to prevent obesity and chronic disease while at the same time promoting economic development and they seek to change menu availability and pricing over a period of years. There are cons some considerations. Uh, we'll need to be sure we collect data on the menus in each restaurant, as well as contextual factors or perceptions uh, that may influence patron decision making, and we'll collect sales records. And this is perhaps, uh, if you all have not used the measure measures, pardon me, measures registry, uh, this slide will walk you through what it looks like. You'll log on, you'll choose the food environment domain, environmental observation, metro urban context, and the search feature also lets you add restaurants. You have a series of options. Here are 18 that match what I'm thinking of. I'm able to review what looks relevant simply by title. Maybe there's an author you're familiar with and you're published, and I use the compare feature uh, to come up with some really nice options, some of which have the full instrument available, uh, and as well as information on validity and reliability. Here, uh, the team decides to use the NEMS-R. The instrument uh, is freely available and has been widely used and includes an online training. 
Okay, as we wrap up here, we have a series of conclusions. Finding the appropriate measurement tool is an essential step. You'll have to be sure the tool you choose meets the specific needs of your project and is appropriate for your population of interest. Please look for a tool that has some demonstrated reliability and validity and will work together to contribute uh, both of those aspects to the field. Uh, and we'd like to be, we'd like to choose the most rigorous measure given your project resources, but there is no perfect tool, so you must uh, simply do the best you can. Thanks so much, everyone, and now we have time for questions. Thank you very much, Leslie and Allison. That was just wonderful, and I love your conclusions. Uh, there is a question from our audience that relates to um, the uh, conclusions, and, your, and that is, um, finally, there is no perfect tool. And so there was a question about what to do, and I'll ask this of all the panelists, what to do if uh, you're not flexible or you're just not able to use what you would identify as the best measure or measures? This is Sharon. I'll just jump in on that. So we highlighted 10 guiding questions that we had adapted from the literature on physical activity and sedentary behavior. And as with the prior 10 questions, we left logistical considerations to the end so that you consider what's the best possible tool for my situation, but then also weigh the expertise that you have, the financial resources, the time, all that kind of thing, so that you really can have the best choice for your study. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Okay, thank you so much, Sharon. So uh, we had a question um, for the um, individual diet presentations, and I'm just uh, looking back to find it. Sorry, we've had an, uh, a lot of chat here. Um, The, does the guide indicate which measures are in different languages? And that's specifically regarding screeners and FFQs. Hi, this is Jill, and I just wanted to note that the measures registry itself, when you access the measures registry and search for a particular measure, that is some, one of the items that was abstracted, what, what the language was. Um, that the measure is available in. And so on the At a Glance page, there's information. Um, it is true that most of the measures are English, and part of that is due to the fact that the majority of the um, articles that we looked at are English language articles, although not 100% of them, but primarily. So that is one reason why we have more English measures. Um, but we do have measures available in multiple languages, and that is on the At a Glance page. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, another question from participant. Um, is there a link for a reputable web-based 24-hour recall resource? And Sharon, I think you had an answer to that. I do. So the National Cancer Institute in the U.S. has developed the automated self-administered 24-hour dietary assessment tool. It previously was known as a 24-hour dietary recall, but it actually can do both recalls and records. And so if you just Google ASA 24, you'll find it. And we can also share that in the chat box. It's a tool that was it's been out since about 2009. It's been used in thousands of studies. There's actually a Canadian version and an Australian version, which goes back to that idea of harmonizing data across studies. It's available within the US in English as well as Great, thank you. And we uh, just to remind you, if you have a question and you haven't posed it, um, please do. Uh, our next question, um, uh, are the actual tools uploaded in the measures, measures registry, or do we need to contact the creator of tools if we're looking for something specific? Well, this is Leslie. I can, I can answer that. Um, at least in the food measurement section, there's a mixture. In some cases, um, there's actually a link that allows you to download the questionnaire um, or questions that were used or the audit form. Um, in other places, um, you can find that data um, actually through the, um, the manuscript that's, that's uh, typically included on the registry. Um, but in some cases, um, some cases you would have to um, contact the author. 
Great. Thank you so much. And I know we're just about to run out of time, and I want to get to a few more uh, questions quickly. And, and here's one from Brittany. Are there any consultants through NCORE available to help organizations with choosing and implementing the right tools? So this is Jill again, and that's not something that we have set up through NCORE right now, and that's part of the reason sort of through the, the goals of NCORE to help um, facilitate um, both research for researchers and evaluation for practitioners is to provide these kinds of tools like the measures registry and the user guides. Maybe just to add to that, the guides do provide links to a lot of other resources. So for the, from the perspective of individual diet, the, and again, the NCI has a dietary assessment primer that walks through different considerations for different studies to help people choose the best tool for their study. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead. No, that's, I was just going to thank Saipay. Thanks. That's great. Yes. Thank you very much. So. I think we're out of time. If there are questions that you have not been able to uh, hear an answer to, I know that folks are still uh, typing. We're answering some of them in the chat box, and we will continue to monitor those through the afternoon and can um, answer them offline. So please don't think we're cutting you off. This has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, thank you for all of your questions, and especially Thanks so much to our speakers for covering so much so well, so quickly. Um, again, we'll be uh, posting your answers. And I know someone asked if the recording will be available. It will indeed. Um, so let me just get to our part two description just quickly. We really encourage you to come back. Um, our next Connect and Explore is on April 12, and it will describe the two physical activity user guides. You can register with the same link that you used for this webinar or by linking, uh, clicking on the link in the box to the right of your screen. So we encourage you to just uh, go ahead and, and do that now if you would like to do that. Uh, register now. Um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge this project team and thank them uh, one more time. It has been, as you can see, a group effort. Uh, so many people have contributed to this over the last couple of years, and we are delighted to have these user guides. And again, thanks also to the JPB Foundation for uh, uh, underwriting this. It's a this. Request for a user guide is something that we have heard uh, repeatedly since the fabulous measures registry was first available. So thank you uh, to uh, our speakers and the whole project team. Um, so if you have other questions about NCORE or upcoming activities, please email the Coordinating Center at NCORE at FHI360.org. And information about the recording, it will be archived. It will take a, probably a day or so. Uh, but it will be on the NCORE website. And take a look at the website. We've just gone through a major refresh. And uh, we're pleased with it and hope you like it. To access the webinar, use the top navigation and click Webinars. And all the upcoming and archived webinars are displayed in this place. So thank you so much uh, to our guest speakers, uh, to Jill, Sharon, Amanda, Leslie, Allison, and to all of you who uh, spent time with us this afternoon. As one of our speakers mentioned before signing off, please take a moment